the Apostle Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 to 17, wrote the following, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considers me trustworthy, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer, and a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy, because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, Immortal, Invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. I believe that we can all pray and claim this passage of scripture, even today in our own personal lives. Consider the points that Paul just covered. He is thankful to the Lord Jesus, who he acknowledges as his source of strength. And that's something that you and I can acknowledge too. God is the source of our strength. Paul is grateful that the Lord considered him trustworthy and appointed him to his service. Now when it comes to us, the fact that we are here today, the fact that we are still breathing, means that God still has a purpose for our lives. We still have a duty to accomplish as servants of the Most High who are here on earth. And in verse 13, Paul begins to reflect on his sinful past. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor, violent. He acted in ignorance and unbelief, but he was still shown mercy. In fact, twice in verse 15 and 16, Paul refers to himself as the worst of sinners. And even as the worst of sinners, mercy was still extended to him. I believe this is the same for us too. Regardless of the sins you have committed, Jesus Christ has, and is, and he will show you mercy if you repent. Now finally, if you pay attention to verse 14, this is what we should really hold on to. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. This is our reason to be joyful. This is our reason to be full of hope. God has poured out abundantly grace, faith, and his love on us. Now let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for pouring out your amazing grace and your amazing love over my life, over my family, even though I do not deserve it even though we cannot repay you. You have still, in your mercy, loved me unconditionally. 
I pray that you will hold me in your loving arms today. Protect my family and my loved ones. Guide each and every step that I take. Lead me in all my ways. I pray that I would walk by faith and not by sight. I pray that I may always walk under your protection, in your wisdom and in line with your word. There is no guarantee that I will live a life free of trials and tribulation, but I thank you that I do have the guarantee that my help comes from the Lord, and I trust and believe that you will deliver me each and every time that I call on your name. I invite you, Lord, to be close to me as I draw closer to you. You are the giver of all good things, and I thank you because you have given me joy unspeakable. You have given me unmerited favour. You have given me victory over the devil. You give me the strength to overcome each and every challenge that I may face. With your grace and favour, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I thank you and I praise you for being an almighty keeper and a wonderful provider. I pray that my reality will be your goodness, your favour, your love and your peace. I trade in my sorrow and weakness for strength and joy in you, Lord. Take away the voids that are in my life, the feelings of emptiness and make me whole. May I be satisfied by the treasure that is in your word. I pray for peace that passes all understanding, and I declare that that peace is mine in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I may not see all of the attacks from the devil, but I know that you have defended me time and time again. And for that I am grateful. I am grateful for the fact that I am safe. My family is protected. I have breath in my body. I have strength in my bones. Because of you I am healthy. And I live this life with joy inside me. This is evidence that your hand is upon my life evidence of your mercy in my life, evidence that you are a God who has stood by me as my strength, as my shield, as my defender and deliverer. Give me courage and boldness in my faith, God. I pray that you would remove every doubt, every seed of unbelief or fear, I praise you for my family and loved ones. I ask that you will continue to bless us in everything that we seek and everything that we do. I speak victory over all challenges, over all obstacles that I may face today. I claim renewed strength as I wait on you, Lord. Your word is truth and there is power in your word. May the Holy Spirit constantly urge me and convict me to always study and meditate on your word that is living and powerful. I thank you and I praise you for your many promises, promises that provide me with a sense of security promises that provide me with hope. May you continue to pour out your blessings upon my life, 
In the mighty name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. everybody. Heaven and nature, heaven. 
And welcome to Praise Baptist Center's online service. We pray that you are keeping well during this period. Let us be reminded of our vision statement, Go and Make Disciples, and our mission statement, rooted in the word, Sharing the Gospel. Online prayer meeting and online life groups will be on recess until the end of the year. Thank you all for your generous giving. We managed to raise 10,150 ringgit for the Christmas project. This year, there will be no watch night service, but instead, we will have a day of prayer in New Year, 1st January 2021, from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. More information will be provided in the official chat group. Information regarding tithes and offerings have been provided in the PVC official chat group. If you need further information, please contact Sister Phong Pei. Thank you for listening and may you be blessed by the message today. Good morning, Church. This is the last Sunday of year 2020. We are now on the seventh session, the last session of the series and the entitles Agonizing Questions and Astonishing Answers based on the book of Habakkuk. We have covered in session one the nature of God's sovereignty, session two, the nature of prayer. Section 3, the nature of evil. And section 4, the nature of faith. Section 5, the nature of God's judgment. And section 6, the nature of God's character. The title of this final session entitled 
the nature of spiritual maturity. Are we growing spiritually? Or do we remain stagnant or regress in our spiritual growth? How can we identify and evaluate or our own spiritual progress? Listen to the sermon by Dr. Zhang En from Eager Communication and you will know where you are spiritually and take steps to improve in the coming year. Welcome again to Eagles Rendezvous, our spiritual formation ministry. Thank you for your gift and generosity the last six sessions. We are coming to the last session today and we want to continue to encourage you to share and be generous in your gift. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a generous God. You are a God who gives and gives and gives. Help us, O God, to be as generous as you are. And Lord, bless us, bless the gift as well as the giver. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Agonizing questions, astonishing answers, reflections on the study of Habakkuk. We have come to our last session the nature of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is like riding a bicycle on a slope. You either pedal forward or slide down. There's no stationary position. Your faith and my faith must grow. If it stagnates, it will die. And so I pray through these sessions as we study the book of Habakkuk, your faith will grow and mature. What is the nature of spiritual maturity? First, spiritual maturity is commitment to being faithful. The righteous shall live by faith. Another word for faith is faithfulness. Faith life is faithful life. Faithful life is about making commitments. Spiritual maturity is making commitment to God, no matter what. As God strips away our pride and our self-sufficient, we commit to God. As we acknowledge our need for Him in all things, we commit to God. As we learn to trust God for everything, big or small, we commit ourselves to God. Habakkuk's faith and faithfulness grew over these last three chapters. From angry protest in Habakkuk chapter 1 when he cried, Oh Lord, how long? To humble waiting when he said, I stand at the rampart to watch. And then being silent at the rampart as God declares, let the earth be silent. And then to realistic submission. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 2, in wrath, remember mercy. And then to affirming God's sovereignty in his life. I stand in awe of your deeds. To accepting God's will regardless of what happened. I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading. And finally, to inexplicable joy in the midst of impending doom. Though the fig tree does not bud, I will rejoice. I'm reminded of the story of a man who had worked for the company for 25 years. He stormed into the manager's room because he was not promoted. There was a promotion exercise in the organization. Angrily, he said to his manager, I worked for this company for 25 years. I have 25 years of experience with the company. The manager stopped him on his track and said, let me correct you. You don't have 25 years of experience in the company, but you have one year multiplied 25 times. How true of us in our faith? How long have you been a Christian? 5, 10, 20 or 50 years? The question we should ask ourselves is this. 
Do you have 5, 10, 20 or 50 years experience of God or one year multiplied 5, 10, 20 or 50 years? I've been a Christian for 52 years and I have to ask myself honestly, do I truly have 52 years experience of God? Your faith and my faith must grow. Second, spiritual maturity is commitment to refresh our experience of God's faithfulness. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 2 says, Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in all of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk was saying and trusting God, if God had worked in the past, he had every reason to trust God again. And he was convinced that God was going to do it again in spite of his own faithlessness. Pope Francis is right. God's faithfulness is stronger than our unfaithfulness and our infidelities. His prayer, make them known, means make them come alive again. Habakkuk wanted God to reveal his work in new ways, in fresh ways to him. Very often, God's work in our lives remain unseen, unrecognized, and unappreciated. Often, like Habakkuk, we can't see God at work. That's why David Priel was right. He said, renew your work, review your work are both necessary. God renews His work in our life, but we must also allow God to let us see His work in our life. In order for faith to grow, we need a fresh work of God in our lives. And we need to recognize God's work in our lives. For some of us, God has worked in the past, but not now. Let me ask you, as I ask myself, are we still awed by what God is doing in our lives? Or have we become too bland? We need God's fresh working in our lives. I like the song by Jim Reeves, an old-time singer. How long has it been? How long has it been since you talked with the Lord and told Him your heart's hidden secrets? How long since you prayed? How long since you stayed on your knees till the light shone true? How long has it been since your mind felt at ease? How long since your heart knew no burden? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? How long has it been since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven? How long since you knew that he would answer you and would keep you the long night through? How long has it been since you woke with the dawn and felt this day is worth living? Can you call him your friend? How long has it been since you knew that he cared for you? Yes, how long has it been? In Rav, remember mercy. Habakkuk was torn. He recognized that God was a holy God. He was torn between God's righteousness and God's love. In the midst of God's righteous anger against his people and the Chaldeans, Habakkuk prayed, God, remember mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. The Hebrew word for mercy is a very interesting word because underlying it is the word used for womb and signifies a warm love of great depth. The love of God is so strong that even when God is flagrantly ignored, deserted or rejected by us, He's drawn as a husband to his wife or mother to her child to love in spite of the actions of the other. The wrongs are real, but so too are the compassion and the desire to forgive. Third, spiritual maturity is commitment to recount God's deep involvement in life. In Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, we read, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Parant. 
His glory covered the heavens. His praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Plague went before him. Pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the each old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. I saw the tents of Kushan in distress, the dwellings of Midian in anguish. What did Habakkuk recount? First, Habakkuk recounted God's involvement in history. Timon and Mount Parand. These are locations in Edom directly associated with the giving of the law at Mount Sinai and the acts of God on behalf of his people in the days of Moses. God left his place in Mount Sinai to come to Egypt to deliver his people. Habakkuk recounted and pondered on the remarkable events on a white canvas from the 400 years in Egypt culminating in God's deliverance from Pharaoh through the wilderness wanderings, the events surrounding Mount Sinai, the handover from Moses to Joshua right up to their entry into the promised land. It is very important, my friend, as we learn how to mature spiritually, is to recount God's acts and mercy in your life in the past. Think of your own past conversion experience. How once you were lost but now found. Once you were dead but now alive. Recount God's healing in your life, in the life of your loved ones. Recount God's provision for you in your studies, in your job, in your promotion, in your business. Don't forget God's mercy. Don't forget that God does not forget about you. Second, recount God's personal coming and splendor. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his power was hidden. Habakkuk saw God marching and coming in majestic splendor. The coming of God was the source of hope for his people. He saw God's transcendent otherness, but yet he also saw God's immanent presence in his life. Here, Habakkuk described God as coming to us, actually moving from point A to point B. The stunning revelation about this transcendent God is that he actually comes. Wow! I was so gripped by this. God does not send his angels. God comes to us personally in the midst of all our pain and trouble, in the midst of our successes and failures, God comes to us. These awesome comings also unveiled his light. The incandescence of God's light is unveiled to dispel darkness. When God comes, God comes in His light to dispel darkness in our life. The light signifies God's penetrating glory and presence in dispelling darkness. This is a very important concept. God's holiness, my friend, is not an evasive holiness, but an invasive holiness. The imagery that I would like to use is like a bride in a beautiful white wedding gown walking on a rainy day. She would tiptoe, hold a wedding gown to make sure that white wedding gown was not messed up by the rain and the dirt and the mud. Sometimes we think of God's holiness like that. God's holiness was an evasive We have to hide. But God's holiness is penetrative. It goes into the dark places of our life. It goes to the dark places of our world, of our society. God's light penetrates. That's why 
we are called to be light of the world. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. If we are truly spiritually mature, we must go to the dark places of life in the dark spots and let our light shine. Third, recounting God's working in disasters. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the nations tremble. Habakkuk recounted the pestilence and the plague. The Israelites had experienced firsthand the power of God, unveiled in the afflictions on the Egyptians and on the rebellious people of God in the wilderness. Listen, God is powerful. In the midst of natural disaster, God is in our midst to heal, to give love, but also to destroy what is not right. Fourth, Habakkuk recounted God's victories over enemies. I saw the tents of Cushion in distress, the dwelling of Median in anguish. God described two Bedouin opponents of Israel, Cushan and Median. Cushan was the first oppressor to contest Israel's occupation of the Promised Land. The Midianites were a regular thorn in the sight of Israel. They had been repulsed by Ophniel and the Midianites by Gideons in times of the judges. Just as God had defeated Israel's enemy, the godless people, the people who practice violence and evil, God will provide victory and defeat violence, corruption and evil. This is the covenant of God. God is a holy God. Four, spiritual maturity is commitment to renouncing evil in our lives. Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. In wrath, you strode through the earth, and in anger, you trashed the nations. You came out to deliver your people, to save your anointed one. You crushed the leader of the land of wickedness. You stripped him from head to foot. Selah. With his own spear, you pierced his head when his warriors stormed out to scatter us, gloating as though about to devour the wretched who were in hiding. You see, my friend, God will summon all creation and all his asana to fulfill his salvation plan. The rivers, the streams, the raging sea, the bowl and arrows, the mountains, the torrential wave, the sun and the moon and lightning. God made it clear. God is against sin with one purpose, to save his people, to save his people who love and live for him. He wants to bring light and life into our lives now and forever in describing the destruction of the wicked. Habakkuk not only stressed that evil was destined to fail, but it was also destined to self-destruct. History is not a series of random, inexplicable events of human design. It is a series of divine action of which there's only one purpose and that purpose cannot be doubted. The salvation of God's people. The bringing of God's kingdom onto earth. God's values, God's righteousness, God's love and the destruction of evil. Listen, my friend. Evil will never prevail, but God will prevail. And therefore, as we live our life, we must learn to renounce evil in our lives. Because evil will kill us, but God will live in and through us. Spiritual maturity is commitment to sharing in and sharing with others in suffering. I heard and my heart pounded. 
my lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crops fails and the fields produce no food. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the store. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Most of us think of suffering as something we should avoid at all costs. There are two types of suffering. One, suffering from and the other, suffering with. Suffering from is to put up with some incomprehensible pain or some uncontrollable events that happen to us. For example, we suffer from illness that we never planned for or fears like what we are going through now in this crisis or pain that we never experienced or injustice that we see in the world and violence in our world. Habakkuk was suffering from anguish and fear. I heard and my heart pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Habakkuk was in a state of agitation, exhaustion and near collapse. The prophet's bones turned to water and it was left without strength. The normal, loquacious and articulate prophet was left speechless. He trembled from head to toe, lips, bones and legs. He was completely overwhelmed. Then he said, Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come to the nation invading us. Habakkuk was not exempted from the turmoil that pervaded and characterized his nation. He could not simply rationalize his crisis. He could not be cerebral and communicate God's word to his audience in a dispassionate way. He was an insider, not an outsider. He suffered with his people. Listen, God expects us to suffer with him and his people people as the smallest price to pay. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, we read, Paul writes, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His suffering, becoming like Him in His death. There are two ways to know God, according to Paul. One is to experience the power of His resurrection, those miracles, those extraordinary events in your life, those death to life experiences. There's another way to know Christ, is to participate in His suffering. The fellowship of Jesus' suffering is not suffering from, but suffering with. Jesus suffered with us. He became a man to feel with us, to feel the hunger, the thirst, the pain, the agony. Jesus chose to suffer with you and me. And Jesus is calling us to participate in his sufferings. So we are called to suffer with others. We suffer with people when we choose freely to let their hurts hurt us, to share in their pains on our own free will. Going to someone who is suffering, going to someone who is in pain, going to someone who is suffering from a loss, that is what Jesus calls us to do. Remember what Jesus said? If you visit a man in prison, you visit me. If you put clothes on a naked person, you clothe me. If you give a hungry person something to eat, you feed me. If you open your door to a stranger, you open the door to me. Whatever you do to the smallest of them all, you do it to me. 
when you suffer with others, you suffer with Christ. Six, spiritual maturity is commitment to celebrate in the community. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet on Shiganov. Habakkuk's prayer was a liturgical worship in community. Habakkuk chapter 2 closed with a proclamation, the Lord is in his holy temple. Habakkuk's prayer must be seen in the context of a bigger community. Habakkuk's faithfulness and faith was nurtured in the community. It was there his commitment grew, his faith grew. How? There are two words. One, Shiganov. Shiganov refers to a kind of performance that will reflect the excitement and celebration of a psalm or a song in the midst of disturbing situations. So we are called to celebrate. Spiritual maturity is an ecstatic celebration in song and worship. That's the celebration of faith. But there's another part. The word cellar occurred three times in this chapter. Cellar means to stop, to pause, and to pause for breath. In other words, we need to be quietly patient, quietly pausing. Quiet patience is the proper atmosphere of true joy. Without inner tranquility, rejoicing is manufactured, superficial and strident. It is rather noisy, even raucous, exuberance, which grates and evaporates. True joy is found in quiet confidence in the Lord who is our strength. Yes, we need to celebrate with ecstasy, but we need to be quiet, quietly confident and quietly patient. That's why Habakkuk could say, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. Habakkuk was facing the ravages of war, the horrors of invasion, and the devastation of nature's resources. The failure of all these resources had serious economic and spiritual ramification. No more grain, oil, or wine. No meat, no wool, no food of any kind. It was the end of everything that keeps soul and body together. There was absolutely nothing left. Having confronted with this reality, Habakkuk declared in no uncertain terms, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my salvation. How can this be? You see, it is one thing to thank God for all the good things in our life, to rejoice in our blessing. It is quite another to praise God when there's nothing. Zero. zero. He has learned to find joy in God himself. And this, my friend, is what it's all about, to find joy in God himself. And this we do in the context of a community. The Christian faith is never solo. The Christian faith must be lived out in community. And we must live out our faith in an accountable community. I had an incredible journey with my friends in the Eagles of 52 years. Peter, William, Michael. We have been friends and we have gone through so many pains and struggles and also so many joys and happiness. So much so that we used to say to one another, there's nothing we will not do for one another. So for the last 50 odd years, we have been doing absolutely nothing for each other. Now that's a joke. I remembered when I was younger, 
I had this tragic experience. We were on the way to Kuantan in Malaysia, and uh, I was driving a car, and Peter was driving another car. He was in front, and I was uh, following him. It rained heavily that morning, and I remembered I was traveling very slowly around the bend, and then when I stepped on the brakes, the whole car turned turtle. The whole world was upside down in slow motion, you know. But thankfully, we did not land in the ditch, but the whole car was wrecked. Fortunately, Peter realized that uh, he couldn't see our car. He turned around and we still had to go to Kuantan for our mission trip. We hopped into his car. And during the entire car ride, I was waiting for them to reprimand and blame me and scold me. But you know, all my friends just had no word of reprimand or blame. Instead, they showed love and comfort and assurance and asked if I was okay and prepared us for that spiritual mission in Kuantan. Two weeks later, I had to go back to Kuantan to pick up the car that had been repaired. One of our buddies, King Wat, accompanied me on the journey. And King Wat was the one who owned the car. Again, he did not blame or reprimand or condemn me. But throughout the car ride back, after we took the car from Kuantan, he showed me love, care, assurance, and comfort. Wow! After that incident and many such similar experiences that we had gone through, there's really absolutely nothing I will not do for my buddies. And I know that there's nothing my buddies will not do for me. That's the beauty of community, that we can learn grow and mature together. Finally, spiritual maturity is commitment to centering our lives in God. Habakkuk prayed, The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. The secret of Habakkuk's confidence and joy is God, the Lord. No technique to master, no guru to consult, no kung fu master to learn from, no formula to adopt. It is God, no more and no less. It is Yahweh, the covenant-making and the covenant-keeping God of Israel, who is the one who will provide him with all the strength that he needs. And it is this same God who will provide you with the strength in all that you need. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. Going on high places like deer is a reference to the rough and tough mountain terrain. Deer skip around with the greatest of ease and confidence, unafraid of the heights of the terrains. The deer is sure-footed, untiring, bounding with energy. The Lord's people may expect to ascend these dangerous terrains with the same confidence. You and I will go through all these tough and difficult terrains of life just like we are going through this crisis. We can do it with sure-footedness, knowing that God is with us. He enables me to go on the heights. The heights refer to places under the control of hostile forces. High places are places of pagan worship. King after king have failed to dislodge these idolatrous places. These high places were high above the surrounding area and those who controlled the high ground controlled the surrounding areas. Habakkuk was given strength to rise above adversity, to climb and not to coast. He had discovered that the secret of turning the mountains into opportunities to discover God's strength in his inner being. Even the most horrifying setbacks cannot break the confidence in Habakkuk's faith. 
I'm reminded of the story of my good friend Timothy, a well-respected architect. He received Jesus Christ into his life at the Eagles Banquet concert in 1982. He was suffering from liver sclerosis, but God healed him in a remarkable way. Timothy was known for his flamboyant lifestyle. Because he came to Christ, 30 of his family and business associates came to Jesus that year. We became very good friends, and I would call upon him at different times of his life, just sharing pains and joys and walking through with him. Just a few years ago, he contracted third-stage pancreatic cancer. And then he shared with me, he said, John, I'm a control freak. For the last 50 years, I've tried to control everything, my business, my family, my children. But when my doctor told me I had pancreatic cancer, I suddenly lose control of my life. And the doctor gave me very little hope. He insisted on going for an operation and he lived for two years. Finally, he passed away. During one of his conversations with me, he shared, said, John, during this time when I had little control, I began to realize that faith is a gift. Trusting God is a gift. That I don't have it in me to trust God, but God gave it to me. I don't have hope, but God gave me hope. Hope is a gift. Because I learned to realize that this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. He went on to say, I also realized that forgiveness is a gift. He said, I had two enemies that I couldn't forgive for a long time. But that year, he met two of these enemies. And he forgave them and they forgave him. He began to realize the wonderful joy of the gift of forgiveness. And then he said, John, I'm no more concerned about being healed physically. He said, I'm more concerned about being more clean spiritually before I meet the Lord. Wow! I told Timothy, you have touched my life. That before I meet the Lord, I want to be more spiritually clean. I want to mature in my faith. I want to have 52 years experience with God, to know God in a deeper way, even when I have nothing. And I've learned to reach out to people who are suffering, especially during this time. I learned to suffer with people. And so my last question to you is, who is that one person whom God is encouraging you to suffer with today so that you can grow and mature in your faith? Could it be a fellow student who has suffered a relational breakup? Could it be an infirmed parent who seemed to have lost hope? Could it be a neighbor who has just lost a job? Could it be a co-worker who is battling with mental exhaustion because of the stress? Could it be a business friend whose industry is collapsing and he's facing bankruptcy? Who is that one person whom God is encouraging you to suffer with so that your faith can mature and learn the suffering of Jesus? Allow me to pray for you as we close. Father, we thank you for life. We thank you for faith. We thank you that our faith must mature and grow. Our faith must not stagnate. We must either move forward or we slide down. So, Father, I pray that we will experience you in such a way during these difficult moments of life. 
that our spiritual maturity will grow and grow and grow. And then, dear God, help us to reach out to someone today, someone who is struggling with life, with faith. Help us to reach out to that person today so that our faith can grow as we participate in your suffering, a suffering with. Thank you, Lord, for this time of study. Thank you. Move us to reach out to someone today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing on the upward way, new heights I may in every day. Still praying as I upward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, my faith on heaven's stable land, a higher place. Year 2020 is drawing to a close. Take time to reflect and examine our own spiritual life. How is your spiritual life? Is it progressing or is it regressing? Are your feet planted on higher ground? Are you committed to follow Jesus no matter what? Come what may. Ask the Lord to continue the process of transformation of our life inside and out. May we conform to His image, manifesting Christ's life in us through the change in our character our conduct and our priorities in life by His Spirit and by His Word.
will bless you, the Lord will keep you, the Lord will make his face to shine upon you, the Lord will bless you, the Lord will keep you, and be gracious unto you. The Lord will bless you, the Lord will keep you, the Lord will make his face to shine upon you. The Lord will bless you, the Lord will keep you, and be gracious unto you. And he will give you peace, and he will give you peace, and he will make his face shine upon you. Oh.